Um, you know how pissed I was? Because he was there and I was like, we could do this right now, you know? Dixie Carter let me take a break. I went to rehab. Uh, she let me stay at home for five months after rehab. She let me heal mentally and physically. But another one I really love watching right now today is Kenny Omega. Uh, he's such a great talent. I love his style. Uh, you know, he, he reminds me a lot of AJ. Kurt, always good to see you. Thanks so much for jumping on. Thanks for having me on, Chris. Now, always good to see you. I like that we're in the uh, the Angle Pod headquarters. That's what that sign says behind you there, right? <laughs> yeah, my wife built this structure here in the background. Uh, you know, it's basically I got them from fans. This is art from a fan. Uh, that was uh, that the the stand up uh, fan gave it to me. I guess they ordered it on WWE.com, but they ended up giving it to me. So these are two gifts from my fans. And you, we can't quite see it, but that stand up there is wearing the cowboy hat. Incredible. Yeah, yeah, the famous cowboy hat. The one I wore was Stone Cold, the same exact one. <laughs> oh, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. You know, speaking of your podcast, I you, you said it a few weeks ago that if you had stayed in WWE, you would have been the greatest of all time. Kurt, I think I speak for everybody when I say you already are the greatest of all time. <laughs> no, I, I think, if you want to be the greatest of all time in one company, uh, you're going to have to be there for 20 years uh, at the very least. I think that's a, a fair assessment uh, when you're talking about like wrestlers, especially look at Shawn Michaels and Undertaker. You know, they spent over 30 years there. You know, I've only been there nine years total. And that was uh, six and a half before I left and then two and a half after. So I, I didn't put in the, the amount of time that, what you would consider to be uh, the greatest of all time. So, you, you know, you list off Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker. Are those, are they the goats for you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, there, there are a lot of people I could throw up there, you know, uh, Mount Rushmore wrestlers, but, you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin, um, you know, Eddie Guerrero. Uh, there, there's so many talented wrestlers. It's really hard to pick the greatest of all time. It truly is because fans, they have their preferences and they're going to pick who they like. And uh, I don't think you're ever going to get like a, you know, out of a hundred votes, you're not going to get a hundred votes for one person being the greatest of all time. It's not going to work. So, you know, you spend a lot of your career in TNA. It was like a decade, your career you spent in TNA. Years, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I could, you be, could you be the goat of TNA? <laughs> uh, I didn't spend 20 years there either. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, nobody spent 20 years there. The company just turned 20 years old. Yeah. Well, you know what? Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, you look at some of the guys that were there, Sting, AJ Styles, um, you know, Samoa Joe. There, there were a lot of formidable wrestlers, and I got the opportunity to work with those guys. Uh, I was utterly surprised when I got to TNA that these guys weren't in WWE already mm -hmm. uh, because they were so talented. But I knew eventually someday they would get there, and they did. I had a really interesting conversation with Hurricane recently, Shane Helms, and we were talking about how, you know, Hurricane's comedy stuff was so, so good. And I think that if there was a Mount Rushmore of comedy wrestlers, it's R-Truth, it's Santino, it's Hurricane. And I also think it's you. And I think people ah. sleep on the fact that not only were you one of the best in the ring, your comedy stuff was so, so good. I, I don't know how, I didn't know how I did it. Um, I was never a funny person. Um, actually, I was never a talker. Uh, I, I, when I started in WWE, nobody trained me to learn how to cut a promo. Um, now they have NXT and they have the amenities to do that. But back then, you know, you were, it was sink or swim. You know, Vince actually told me that the first night on the air. He said, I want you to cut this promo. This is what I want you to say, sink or swim. And, you know, he, he taught, he said something for five minutes straight. He's telling me what he wants me to say. And I'm not listening because I'm like, holy crap, this is a really long promo. And uh, when he got done, I said, Vince, I'm sorry, but I didn't hear a word you said. Can you repeat it? He said, I'll repeat it one more time. And you've got to go out there. And if you if you don't uh, succeed, you're going to sink. You're, you're done. If you, if you do it uh, fairly well or well, then uh, you will uh, swim. You will you will, uh, swim. You won't you won't sink. You won't drown. Is what he said. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll get right back to the conversation in just a second. But Blue Chew, big shout out to them for supporting this episode. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but it's in chewable tablets, and it's a fraction of the cost. 
And even if you don't need help in the bedroom department, whoever your bedroom partner is, I promise you they are going to enjoy it because you'll go from like to and you can interpret that really any way that you'd like. The process is so simple. Just sign up at bluechew.com. Don't forget to use the code CVV. You'll consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you will receive your prescription in just a few days. And let me tell you, my friends, when your package arrives, <laughs> your package arrives. And you can try Blue Chew for free. Yes, for free when you go to bluechew.com and use the promo code CVV at checkout. You just have to pay $5 for shipping. So even if this was something that's not even on your radar, you can give it a try and you can support the channel by using that code CVV at checkout at bluechew.com. There's this interesting thing about when amateur wrestlers get into pro wrestling. It's the idea of like being on your back, right? Like as an amateur wrestler, you never want to be on your back. And in pro wrestling, that's one of the first things you learn is like how to fall flat on your back. I'm curious, do you remember taking your first bump and like what it felt like? Well, you know what? The first bump I took, I actually quit. I was like, this is self-abuse. Uh, I'm not doing this. I told my manager, <laughs> I got up and walked out of the ring. I said, I, I can't do this. And he said, you just stay for the day, get through the day and see how you feel afterward. And uh, I did, and you know, I, I roughed through it, but I'm not gonna lie to you, it, it was it was crazy. It was crazy that these guys bumped themselves in the ring and being an amateur wrestler, you're taught to take the person down. You know, you take them down and you control them and you stay on top of them. You're not used to falling to your back. So what I did is I forgot everything I ever learned. I cut off my instincts because if I would have went in there with my instincts actually on, um, I wouldn't have been able to bump backward. I would have been, you know, using my amateur wrestling techniques. But I forgot everything I learned, and I put myself in the, my opponent's hands and said, do what you want with me. And that, that's how I learned, and I learned very quickly because of that. But that is, that's so much easier said than done, and everyone points to how quickly you picked up pro wrestling. Is it just because you were like, everything I learned before, I just don't remember it now, and like, I'm like clay mold me <laughs> yeah I, I let them mold me and uh i didn't try to mold myself i i wasn't trying to uh make sure i had all my amateur wrestling moves in there i didn't have a move set when we started i decided to start from defense first so i let my opponents attack me and do whatever they wanted with me once i got comfortable with that i started adding my offense in and that's where it really worked and uh, that's when the, the light bulb went off in my head and I, and I understood what I had to do. And I, you know, knowing that my instincts weren't taking over anymore, that I was actually using my head the whole time, thinking the whole time, which is what you do with the psychology and wrestling. You know, you, you always want to think ahead of what's going on. And you, 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 you're you going to have to improvise at certain times. And at certain times, you're going to have to memorize. But uh, it, it's a very uh, tricky art form. Do you remember like a specific match or moment where you were like, okay, yep, I figured this out? Um, I would probably say, oh man, probably my match with Chris Benoit. I can't remember when it was or where it was. Um, it was before my first WrestleMania and Chris and I had this match and uh, it was phenomenal. And I felt like I, kind of got into my own groove. Uh, it was a pay-per-view before WrestleMania, and it was against Chris Benoit. And that's when uh, I thought, okay, I think I'm starting to get this. I'm starting to learn because I was clueless. You have to understand, I, I only trained for seven months before I went on TV. Um, that That's literally nothing. And 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 four of those months were only four days a month, a month training up at the WWE headquarters. And the rest yeah. of the month, I stayed at home doing nothing. So I, I didn't have much training. So they... They just told me, learn on the job. And I was learning on the job. And what's what I was very fortunate of is Vince really pushed me hard at the beginning. Like, you know, he pushed me to the top, you know, within a, a few months. And it was like, whoa, you know, I, I need to get a hold of this. I need to learn what I'm doing. And uh, before I before I get to that level. But Vince, was, he was rushing me. He was pushing me hard. So I, I was forced to learn on the job. I really was. The work you did with Chris Benoit, I think a lot of fans point to is like, those are some of your best matches. Those might even be some of the best matches in WWE, period. 
And your name came up recently when I talked to Dave Meltzer, and I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> yeah. According to Dave, you've never had a five-star match. No, Dave. I don't know if Dave likes me or not or what's going on, but uh, you know what? It's his opinion. I I, I will respect that. I, I do understand. Uh, he's very knowledgeable with wrestling. Maybe he just doesn't like my style. I don't know, but uh, – it's unfortunate that I don't have a five star match from him, considering that people take his his um, you know his word uh, as as valuable. You know they they look at him and say, okay, this is the guy that rates the matches, and he's pretty accurate with it. So I you know I just I don't know what to say. I I'm really surprised I haven't had one five star match, but you know that that's his opinion, and I have to respect that. Look, I think we're all surprised you haven't had like 10 five-star matches when you look <laughs> at it. But does does that bother you at all? No, no, I, because it's only one person's opinion. Um, I, I do have uh, somewhat of a respect for Meltzer because of all the years he's put in. Uh, so I would love to have a five-star match rating, but, you know, he, he just didn't feel that I did. And like I said before, it's it's his opinion. If we were to, you know, put make a list right now, you and I of Kurt Angle five star matches, where do we begin? Oh God, uh, Undertaker No Way Out two thousand six, uh, Shawn Michaels WrestleMania twenty one, Eddie Guerrero SummerSlam two thousand four, um, uh, Brock Lesnar Iron Man match on SmackDown. Uh, geez, I, I would say. Uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, Rock, my first world title against The Rock. Um, there, there are a lot of matches. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> I, I would say, <laughs> me personally, I would rate myself five stars for about 20 of the matches, but, but <laughs> which, that's not necessarily going to be true. Which AJ Styles match is a five star match? Oh, gosh, every match with AJ. Uh, you know what? That kid is so talented. I literally didn't have to do anything when I worked with him. He flew around. All I did was catch him. You know, he he was so talented and just an incredible high flyer. Uh, also a great heavyweight wrestler. Uh, he has all the tools to be considered one of the greatest of all time. Um, I've had incredible matches with AJ. And I'm, I'm utterly surprised that Meltzer didn't rate any of those matches five-star, too. Or well, some other. Kurt, yeah. according to Dave Meltzer, there's only been one five-star match in the history of TNA. And whose was it? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's AJ versus Joe versus Daniels, the three way oh, unbreakable. The for the X yeah, yeah. But I mean, it you, mentioned great match. Yeah. you mentioned Joe, like the matches with you and Joe are incredible. Yeah. Like at least yeah. one of those is a five star match. Yeah, I would I would think so, but it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> when we look at TNA, and I mean, you were there for a good chunk of you know TNA's history. What for you is the heyday of TNA? What's what's TNA's prime in your opinion? I would say when we signed Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair, Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, um, Booker T. Uh, this all came like within like two years, a two year span. All these guys came in and uh, we started, we formed the main event mafia. And I think the main event mafia was definitely uh, the highlight of, of TNA. Uh, there are also other factions that did really well. Um, the one, uh, what's, what was it called? Um, uh, the one that Bully Ray was Aces in. Aces and Eights. Aces and Eights. That was a really good one. Uh, but I think TNA's prime was when they had those factions at that particular time, probably between 2008 and 2012. Yeah, it was I really good. Time. Our ratings were up too. We were, we were doing over 2 million viewers a week, which was pretty impressive for Spike TV. That was the time when you guys went head to head with Raw for I mean, a handful of weeks. Big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Big mistake. You know, I, I always told the boss, Dixie Carter, I said, listen, there's no shame in being number two. You know, WWE is a machine and nobody's going to pass them up. Not TNA, nobody, nobody ever. And uh, I said, you, you just be happy with number two. But she wanted to be number one. And, you know, we took chances and, you know, some of it backfired on us. And we lost a lot of money doing it. But uh, at least we tried. 
I mean, I think it was exciting to see, like you talk about, I mean, almost 3 million people were tuning into Impact at that point in time. It, it was really cool, man. I, You know, knowing that, you know, with w, now don't get me wrong, when I was in WB at one point, we were doing 10 million viewers a week right? during the Attitude Era. So uh, I didn't never thought in a million years TNA would get to that level. But uh, but then, then the business started calming down and, you know, WWE was getting three, four million viewers. But then TNA came on and, you know, when we started doing 2.1, 2.2 million, uh, that was pretty impressive for a small company like TNA. Yeah. There are so few surprises in wrestling. But when you signed with TNA, like, I feel like everybody was legitimately surprised. I'm so curious, what did you guys do to make sure that that was kept a secret? <laughs> Dixie Carter told everybody, listen, don't say a word. Anybody that knew about it, please do not say a word. The office knew, the wrestlers didn't know. Because they flew me down to Nashville to do a promo video for when I debuted. And uh, the employees there had to sign NDAs that uh, they wouldn't tell. And if they did, they would get sued. So uh, they kept it very tight-lipped. I was really impressed by that. Uh, the night that uh, they showed me, uh, I think it was at a pay-per-view after the pay-per-view, um, the wrestlers were more surprised than the fans. They're like, holy crap, Kurt Angle's coming. So they kept it tight-lipped. I was really impressed with that. And, uh, you know, uh, for, for you know, in pro wrestling, it's really hard to keep anything a secret. And they were able yeah. to do that. So the, that's the promo where you're like, it's real, it's damn real. Like, and then the yeah, very yeah. evil laugh at the camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, that was me. Um, you know, barking at the WWE. <laughs> to be honest with you, uh, that I I love the yeah. Like a, the, the you would do it in TNA frequently. You would look at the camera. Yeah, I can't do it nearly as well as you. But... <laughs> I can't do it anymore either. <laughs> oh come! You feel like there's nothing yeah! you can't do anymore. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, hey, ever since I retired, I lost my intensity, man. I, <laughs> so you only have two eyes now? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I don't have intensity. I have integrity. and in The intelligence flew out the window, too. I only so have just, one. just one of the three <laughs> eyes now? <laughs> yes. I don't know. I, I saw recent photos of, of you, eyes. and, like, you're, you're in insane shape. And I know that you work out really hard, and you're, you've got – the supplements, which I know is a big part of this, but I feel like just from looking at you, it's like, I feel like Kirk could still go. I wish, you know what, my quality of life right now, Chris, isn't so good. Um, I had my knees replaced about a year ago. I had back surgery uh, about four months ago. I have to have my shoulder replaced. Um, I still have another neck surgery come up, coming up. That will be my fourth neck surgery. Um, I really paid the price uh, wrestling as well as I did. I wrestled amateur wrestling for 20 years and then pro for 20. And um, looking back, I sometimes I regret maybe I should have retired five years earlier. Because, you know, it, it comes to a point in time in your life where you're you're older and you want to play with your kids. And here I am having these surgeries and I'm, I can't really do anything with them. I can't pick them up. I can't play with them. I can't run with them. Uh, so it gets a little disgruntling that uh, I'm not able to um, – be the father that I want to be. And uh, and what I'm doing now is I'm having these surgeries to have a better quality of life so I can play with them. And I just I want to make it fast because these kids are growing up quickly and I, I don't want to miss it. Are you in pain like every day with what you have going on? Every day, every day. My back, my shoulder, my knees are good. My knees feel great. Uh, they, they recover really well. Um, I'm 100% with my knees. But uh, my neck and my back and my shoulder, I have, a, I have a lot of pain running all day long, all night. Um, so it's something I just have to deal with until I have these surgeries and until I recuperate. I wonder if uh, some DDPY could help you out. You know what? I, 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 I should be doing it. And uh, I wish I would have when I was wrestling because I do believe that I would have had a longer career and I would have been healthier right now. And I decided not to. I, I didn't do any maintenance when I was wrestling. I didn't even, I barely stretched. I would just twist my my hips like this a couple of times and go out and wrestle. And uh, being lazy caused me to, um, uh, for my body to um, damage even further. And uh, I could have done a lot of maintenance and kept it. Look at Chris, look at Chris Jericho and Rey Mysterio. Yeah. They do yoga. They're still wrestling. 
They've been wrestling for almost 30 years now. There's a reason for that because they took care of the bodies. Do you think there was, you know, maybe a period of time probably in TNA where you're like, man, I should take some time off. I shouldn't push this so much, but I just want to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. There were a lot of times I did that, but the cool thing about uh, being in TNA is, you know, I, 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 I had surgery on my neck one at one point and I had to be out for nine months and Dixie Carter paid me my full salary the whole time. Uh, she was really cool. Uh, you know, when I, when I got in trouble and, uh, you know, I had my uh, problem with alcohol, um, you know, Dixie Carter, let me take a break. I went to rehab. Uh, she let me stay at home for five months after rehab. She let me heal mentally and physically. And, uh, and I, I owe her a lot for that. Uh, so she, she was a great boss and she was really cool about, uh, making sure that I was uh, healthy mentally and physically. And, uh, but I'm not going to lie to you. There were times where I should have taken more breaks and I didn't because I loved it. I loved being there and I loved working for Dixie and doing what I had to do to, to, to make the company better. There's a few highlights from your time in TNA that get replayed all the time, like even to this day. And I think the one that immediately pops into my head is the moonsault off the cage <laughs> to Ken Anderson. I actually talked to him about it. He he told me this story that you guys were supposed to ha originally have a 23 minute match and mm -hmm. they cut it down to like 10 minutes. And then you go out there and he said that you told him, don't worry about it. We're just going to keep going. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was pissed off. They cut our match a lot of time. I was like, screw that. We're taking, we're taking our 23 minutes. So, uh, <laughs> but you know what? You don't do that in pro wrestling. I, I shouldn't have done that. That's the wrong thing to do, unfortunately. But I knew this match was really special. Um, I knew Ken and I were going to have this great match. And, and let me explain why. Okay, Vince Russo put this match together. He set the rules for the match. It made no sense because they won the match in a cage, okay? But you can't climb out to win, all right? You have to – you can't get pinned to win. The only way you can win – is going outside the door. So they, they painted us in a corner. They Because what are we going to do? Why do we want to climb the cage to have stunts off the cage if you can't leave the cage over right. the top and win? So why would you climb in the first place? So we had to think of ways. We had to get creative and think of ways of why we would go up there. And uh, it, was, it was a really tough match to uh, put together because we were limited to just leaving the, the the door. And, you know, if you just have guy, two guys trying to leave the door and that's the, what the whole match is all about, it's going to be boring as hell. So we, we had to get creative. We had to think of reasons why we had to climb a cage and why we had to use the cage. Uh, and uh, with not having pins really, um, uh, we couldn't have any false finishes. So th that kind of sucked. So they painted us in the corner and I was pissed off, so I was like, I'm taking all the time I want. <laughs> and uh, we ended up uh, taking the whole 23 minutes. We might have taken more than that, actually. <laughs> what are you thinking when you're climbing up there and you're about to do that moonsault from that height? Praying to God I don't get injured. I even did the sign of the cross right before I before I went. Um, yeah, that's it's scary, man. And you know what? I, I never practiced it before. My first moonsault ever was on Bob Holly, and I broke his arm. I fell short because I never did it before and I never practiced, so I didn't know how far out I was going to go. And I, I came up short, my legs hit his arm and uh, broke his arm right in half. And uh, so uh, not, never practicing it, um, you know, I, I th those aren't the moves you want to practice because the bumps are so hard. They're ridiculous and hard. So uh, it's something you just say, what the heck, just go you know, and hopefully you land properly. <laughs> and I mean, in this one, you landed, it almost looked like you landed on Ken's face. I did land on his face. <laughs> uh, you know, I, but, um, you know, I don't know. The thing is, I, I ended up covering him, but I, I didn't know if uh, hitting him on his face was really going to hurt him enough to pin him. You know, I, I don't know. But if I would have landed on his stomach, he could have sold his stomach. But it's really hard to sell your face. <laughs> sure. Another yeah. clip that gets brought up all the time is when you run off the ramp, you do the full somersault and then you land there. Like, I don't know, it just, it, it seemed, seemed so like such a risky move, but you also made it look so easy. You know what? Uh, I knew Abyss was going to catch me. 
And that that's why I wasn't that concerned about it. He's a big dude. And as long as you land on him, you know, you're not going to get hurt. So uh, he was a lot of the reason why I did it. I wouldn't have done it with anybody else, but I know this guy, you know, he's 350 pounds big. He's, he was going to catch me. He was going to make sure it was safe. So I was cool with it. During those 10 years in TNA, was there ever a, a point of time that you were ever going to go back to WWE? Yeah, I thought about it all the time. Um, don't get me wrong. I really love TNA. Um, the thing is, when I started thinking about going back to WWE was when the money started running out mm -hmm. and people were getting let go or people were getting laid off. And, uh, you know, I signed my last contract with them. I think it was for five more years. And uh, and I figured, you know what, after this contract is up, they probably won't have the money to pay me because they were paying me a, a seven figures. So and it was a part time deal. Uh, so I, I knew that um, they probably wouldn't give me that money that I was making. So I figured, you know what, it's time to think about going back to WWE. And, and I also wanted to go back because I wanted to go back for the fans and to thank them, the WWE universe, uh, because I had six and a half incredible years in WWE. And I wanted to go back and thank the fans personally and perform for them before I retired. How close were we to getting you versus John Cena for your retirement match? Well, I would have had to stay another year. Um, I was doing a program with Baron Corbin when I decided I was going to retire. Um, the reason why I decided to retire is because I wasn't me anymore. Um, I was a half a step behind. Um, I looked like I was old when I was wrestling. I didn't like what I saw. And, uh, you know, Vince wanted me to keep wrestling. And um, I told him, listen, uh, this WrestleMania, I think it was 36, I think, was when I retired. I can't remember. 36 or 37. New York. 35, right? okay. Um, and uh, I wrestled Baron Corbin. And I asked Vince, hey, can I have John Cena? Because I started his career. I think it would be proper if he ended my career. And Vince said, uh, no, you have Baron Corbin. You've been doing a program with him for six months. You have to continue. But if you want Cena, you can have him next year. And I said, well, I, I'm only going to go to this WrestleMania. And he said, well, then you're going to wrestle Baron Corbin. Uh, are you okay with that? I said, yeah, that's fine. So I, I wasn't able to get Cena, but he gave me the option. If I wanted to continue on and wrestle another year, then I could wrestle Cena. Yeah, but think about it. The next year, WrestleMania was in front of no audience. So <laughs> I know. <laughs> I feel like this actually kind of worked out better. You got to say goodbye to the fans. Yeah, yeah. That would have been hard to retire uh, the following year during the during the pandemic. Um, you know, how do you say bye to fans when they're not there? <laughs> Although I guess the most heartbreaking breaking part about WrestleMania 35 is John Cena was there, right? He was unannounced, came out, made that surprise entrance. Um, you know how pissed I was because he was there and I was like, we could do this right now. You know, he came up to me and said, hi. I was like, I didn't even know you're going to be here. He said, yeah, I was going to make a surprise. And I was like, you know, I wanted you. He said, yeah, I want you too. And, you know, it's just unfortunate. Yeah. Just if, like, it feels like in hindsight, it, it could have made sense, right? You're both there. You, I don't know. I mean, it is what it is, right? <laughs> Close, but no cigar, Chris. That, that's one of those, I think, what if matches. What's another match in your career that just never ended up happening? I think last time we talked, it was like you versus Bret Hart could have maybe happened at some point in time, but just didn't. Uh, Bret is my number one pick, always will be. I, I love his style. I love the way he worked in the ring. I knew that I would uh, have great chemistry with him. But another one I really love watching right now today is Kenny Omega. Uh, he's such a great talent. Um, I love his style. Uh, you know, he, he reminds me a lot of AJ, AJ Styles. He, uh, he has great uh, heavyweight wrestling skills, and he also has uh, a lot of high-flying stunts that are incredible, remarkable. So I, I would love to wrestle him. Um, if, if that was an opportunity, if I had an opportunity and I, and, uh, I was five years younger, um, I definitely would take that up, definitely. Could you imagine Kurt Angle versus Kenny Omega in Japan? <laughs> that would be awesome. That's where it should be, too. <laughs> that is where it should be. When you think about people who've gone from amateur wrestling to pro wrestling and knocked it out of the park, there's obviously no one better than you. 
but I'm really curious what your thoughts uh, of Gable Stevenson are. Like he's following your footsteps here. Uh, he, I heard he, first of all, he's, a, he's an incredible athlete. Um, uh, you know, you, you, he not only incredible uh, on the mat wrestling. I mean, this kid, you know, he can do backflips. He's, he's really athletic, super athletic. And um, I think he's going to have a great future. I just don't know how entertaining he's going to be. I know that he loves to talk. Uh, a lot of his friends that I talk to say he's kind of a loud mouth, which is kind of good because you want to be able to, you don't want to be shy when you're in this. You know, I was a shy kid. And when I went to WWE, I had to learn how to suck it up and just go out there and put everything on the line. And it was really a hard transition for me. But I think Gable Stevenson will have the same thing. He'll probably, um, uh, you know, have to, you know, break that mold of uh, of being an amateur wrestler. Because as an amateur wrestler, you show no emotion. You go out there, you focus, and you wrestle, and you go for the pin. It's not like pro wrestling where you have to show people emotion. You have to show if you're scared or if you're mad or if you're, you know, excited. Um, so th there's, a, there's a lot of, um, um, you have to have uh, incredible charisma. And I think that Gable has that. I just don't know if he how how well he's going to translate that when he starts talking. Uh, I do remember doing a pre tape with him in Pittsburgh, and uh, he he did all right. You know, he didn't do incredibly well, but he he did well. That it was like okay, this kid he has potential. I think he's going to be pretty good. So I expect him to have a great career. I don't know if he's going to have the career I had, but um, I think it, he could. He could definitely. Well, he's out there wearing his gold medal, and I think there's a lot of fans going. <laughs> yeah. That looks familiar. Hey, I, I heard uh, they have him pulling his straps down, doing the ankle lock. So uh, you know, I, I think I think it's a brilliant thing because the fans are like, "Whoa, you're trying to be Kurt Angle, and we don't like it." Yeah, the so crowd is chanting, "You're not Angle." Uh, yeah, you know it's crazy. I think they wanted that. They, the WWE. The, they're not stupid, man. They they want him to be a heel starting out. That's why I was too. So I think it was a really smart decision to do that. Now you have made him something where the fans care about him. Because, you know, when you come in and they see this Olympic gold medalist, they say, okay, dazzle us. Show us what you have. Yeah. And he's going to have to go out there and prove himself. But if you if you have the fans not like him, where they care about you, whether they love you or hate you, they actually care about you. That's good. And mm -hmm. I think this was good because they don't know who he is. They know he's an Olympic gold medalist, but they, they don't know what he's about. And, mm -hmm. and, and if you turn, if you make him a heel off the bat, it's a lot easier than trying to make him a baby face. When we would see you out there <clears throat> wearing the gold medal that looked like your 1996 Atlanta gold medal with the green, what, what, what are we actually seeing there? Uh, with Gable? No, with you. When you, like, there was the one you would wear that was the red, white, and blue, like clearly like a, a Oh, yeah, yeah. Those are my little, uh, little league gold medals. <laughs> I, I was wearing those. Okay, when I started uh, in WWE, Vince McMahon told me, I want you to wear as many gold medals as you can. Okay. He's like, you have a lot of gold medals at home. I said, yeah, from when I was a kid. He said, I want you to put those around your neck. So I was wearing like 25 gold medals. Okay, and Vince wanted me to be like over the top. He wanted me to heel out on the fans and just be this arrogant asshole, you know? And uh, so I, I remember going to the arena and Jerry Briscoe, who was Vince's right arm man back then, uh, um, he told me, hey, Vince wants you to wear those gold medals everywhere. I was like, what do you mean everywhere? He said, outside, at the airport, in the restaurants, when you go home, when you're flying in the airplane, he wants you to wear the gold medals all the time. I'm like, that's crazy. He said, yeah, but he wants you in character 24-7. Wow. So I'm wearing these gold medals everywhere, and I end up going to Raw the next week, and I walk into the building, and Vince McMahon looks at me and says, why are you wearing your gold medals? I said, Jerry Briscoe said, you wanted me to. He said, no, you only wear them when you're at the building. You don't wear them all over the place. So it was a rib on me. And um, so what Vince did – as he told me, you know what? You don't have to wear all these medals anymore. Just wear a couple of them. And then eventually, a few months later, he said, where's your real gold medal? And I said, it's at home. He said, why don't you bring it with you? I want to make copies of them. So they made molds of them, and they made copies. And eventually, I started wearing the gold medal with the green um, 
um, what do you call it, the ribbon around it. So uh, th that's how I started wearing. It wasn't my real gold medal. It was it was two copies. They were duplicates. Oh, where does your gold medal live now? In a safe. And the reason is, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, one of my kids one day was playing with it, and they had the ribbon. They were flinging it around, and they accidentally let it go, and it hit the wall. And there's a huge dent in my gold medal. I was like, okay, no more. <laughs> These kids aren't playing with my gold medal anymore. I'm going to keep it in the safe and I'll bring it out whenever I need to go to an appearance or whatever to, if I'm doing a speaking engagement. So I keep it in a safe now away from my kids. I love that there's a dent in your gold medal, but likely not a dent in your wall. <laughs> I know. Man. Well, uh, you know, there, there was a huge dent in my wall from that. And my wife was pretty pissed off. So <laughs> that happened too. I want to go back to some of your comedy moments. Uh, I, I think one of the big ones for me is Sexy Kurt. Did you come oh, up with the lyrics for Sexy Kurt? No, I had a great writer, Chris. Uh, this kid was uh, amazingly talented. And you know what? I don't blame him for doing this, but The Rock stole him from the WWE. Okay? He used to write for The Rock, Chris Jericho, for me, Edge and Christian, and Hurricane Helms. And, Are you talking and to Brian, had great... Brian? Is this Brian Gerwitz? Brian Gerwitz? Brian, Brian Gerwitz, yeah. Gerwitz, yeah. that's it. I, yeah. And um, uh, so he wrote all my promos, and uh, we had incredible chemistry. He he knew exactly what he wanted my character to be, um, and he knew I was going to be like a nerd, milk drinking, you know, abide by the rules, but not really abide by the rules, kind of like, uh, you know, um, do things, that, say things uh, that, that I want that I want people to, the, the way they should live their lives by the three eyes, but not really do it, you know, be a heel. And uh, so Brian understood my character and he wrote incredible material for me. Uh, the rap with John Cena, he wrote that. He wrote the sexy Kurt. He wrote just about everything. Uh, I don't know if you remember my promo about uh, Rey Mysterio, you're a boy in a man's world. And I'm a man who loves to play with boys. <laughs> like he would come up with the funniest stuff. And I'd be cracking up. I, I literally couldn't wait to go to work every week to see what I was going to have to, what, what I was going to do next. I was so excited. My first year in the business was the funnest year of my life. You must have been reading that man who plays with boys promo going, oh my God, this is incredible. <laughs> I was, I was like, man, this is genius, you know? And like, I was pretending like I was flubbing, you know? No, no, that's not what I meant. Ray, and then I would say something else and I'd mess up again. Uh, it was a lot of fun. The fans absolutely loved it. I, you know, you know what I love what the fans say to me, Kurt, I hated your guts when I was a kid, but now looking back, what you did was hilarious and entertaining. And I understand why I hated you because you did a great job doing that. You made everybody hate you and you did, you, you did your job. And I, I appreciate you for that. And that, that's the best feeling I can get. That's the best, you know, um, not advice, but it, it's the best uh, like a compliment. message that I could get from the fans. Yes. Mm. I, I just think your commitment to everything that you did, whether it was you being intense or whether it was you making us laugh our asses off, your commitment to it was just, I think, unmatched. Well, <laughs> you know what? Um, there, there have been other guys, you know, you look at Roddy Piper and, you know, guys that were the frontier before me. Uh, he, he was a guy that cracked me up. Uh, you know, I didn't watch pro wrestling a lot, but Roddy kind of became mainstream and, you know, him and Hulk Hogan and, uh, seeing Roddy, I, I remember a movie he did. It, it was, uh, it was an alien movie. It was really funny and, uh, he was great in it, but, you know, I always wanted to be someone like Roddy and not someone that was just uh, uh, no disrespect to uh, Bret Hart, but someone that was just incredible in the ring. I wanted to be entertaining overall, like every, every aspect of pro wrestling. And, and I was lucky enough to do that. I've always wondered the King of the ring spot with Shane McMahon, how many more times would you have tried <laughs> if that glass didn't you know ever end up breaking? Well, okay. What happened was, I don't know if you know this, Chris, but it was supposed to be sugar glass and it was plexiglass. So it was accidental. They ordered the wrong glass. 
So when I was throwing Shane through, he was bouncing off of it and his head was landing on the hardwood floor, the concrete floor. And um, the first one, when I threw him through it, he didn't go through. I grabbed him and I said, listen, let's, let's just move on. He said, no, throw me through the effing window. And I was like, okay, we'll do it again. I went to do it again. He bounced off again. I said, Shane, we can't do it again. He said, do it again. And I threw him a third time and he went through. And then I had to throw him back through the other way. And he bounced off one time and I said, screw it. And I threw him head first through it because <laughs> I, I didn't want him to end up having a concussion. He landed on his head three times on the concrete floor. Oh. And his dad was out of his seat getting ready to stop the match. Oh. He literally was, people were holding him back saying, Vince, don't go out yet. Hurts, Hurts taking care of him. Don't worry, he won't get hurt. Vince was really pissed off about that. And uh, I don't blame him. That was his son. Yeah. Tell me about your supplements. I've seen you talking about them. And I assume that if I take them and, you know, work out as hard as I like to work out, I can look like you. You know what? I have I have a bag here of some of them. They're called chicken snacks. And I have one that's uh, organic plant protein. This is chicken protein. I have an organic plant pro protein called Snack Smart. Uh, we also have the whey protein version. And these are crispy protein bites. They're incredible. Um, they're 11 different flavors. They're all amazing flavors. One is cinnamon swirl. This one's sriracha. If you like spicy and sweet, this is really good. Um, but um, we, you can order them at physicallyfit.com. Uh, go to physicallyfit.com. If, uh, if you want 20% off your first order, use the code ANGLEPOD. You'll get 20% off. Or if you want to be a member for life, 20% off for your rest of your life, be a lifetime member, go on the website and sign up physicallyfit.com. You get 20% off the rest of your life. I also have another uh, supplement called um, American dream cookies and cream protein. It's made by project one nutrition. I partner with these guys and they made this incredible protein because I love milk and cookies. They made cookies and cream protein for me. And it's incredible. It's the best tasting protein on the market. The way you can order it is project1nutrition.com. Go on there. You can order my protein. It's called Kurt Angle. Uh, Kurt Angle's American Dream Cookies and Cream Protein. It's delicious. Go to project1nutrition.com. Kurt, it's always so good to be able to catch up with you, spend some time with you. I, you know I what, Chris? Kind of... You're easy, man. Your interviews are so great. I love doing them. Dude, you are you are so kind. I I, I love having you on. I, I feel like I could talk to you for 17 hours because you've got so many incredible stories. Uh, thank you, man. I, uh, I end every conversation with the same question because gratitude is such a big part of my life. Actually, I asked this of your wife when she was on the show, Giovanna. What are three things in your life, Kurt, that you're grateful for right now? Uh, my faith in, in Jesus Christ, uh, my family, and you know what? Um, my health. Uh, knowing that uh, besides the um, aches and pains, uh, knowing that uh, I'm healthy from a blood test perspective and you know i don't have any kind of disease because my family uh hereditarily we we have we have cancer in my family we have uh diabetes we have heart disease but i don't have any of those and i'm very grateful for that but actually before we wrap this up i don't know why i didn't start with this you were one of the first wrestlers that i ever met in uh in 2001 i wonder if my camera can focus on this I met you in Toronto, <laughs> 2001. That's me in this the middle of my friend Mark. Look at that, right? <laughs> and I got, it was, you did a signing with Christian and Trish Stratus in Toronto. I remember. <laughs> the XFL kickoff party. I waited six hours in February, February 1st, to get your autograph in Toronto. Little did you know, 20 years later, you'd be sitting down with me doing an interview. <laughs> absolutely incredible so i want to thank you for your time then and oh, i want to thank you for your time now and you know in my books kurt you truly are the greatest of all time thank you chris i appreciate it man thank you so much my friend